This episode was made possible by CuriosityStream. Hi there, welcome to Up and Adam. I'm Jade and I'd like to show you something, if I may. This is a toy Ferris wheel made out of 429 individually cut pieces of wood. This took me and my dad 15 hours to assemble by hand. And that was the easy part. Let's not forget everything that went into this creation before we even started building it. Like the hours or days of carefully planning the design so that every cog would work perfectly with the others. The advanced technology used to cut each individual piece. Someone had to write out all the instructions so that people like me, who have never done something like this before, could understand it. But even though a lot of work went into the making of this wooden contraption, you're probably not very surprised. It's a fairly sophisticated piece of machinery, so this seems pretty normal to us. The more complicated a piece of work is, the more planning went into its design, and the more manpower went into its building. And you know, even though this is clever and complicated, there are a lot of things it can't do. It can't, for example, make a copy of itself. It can't protect itself from an attack. It can't grow or react to its environment. In fact, Compared to even the simplest processes we see in nature, it can't do much at all. A quick walk in the garden exposes us to behaviours infinitely more complex than the wooden wheel. Autonomous creatures with a will of their own, effortless growth and reproduction cycles, huge colonies of individual interacting parts, and creatures made up of thousands of moving parts and processes. But how did all of this complexity come into being? Where are the blueprints for these impressive structures? Who designed the mechanics by which they move? What I'm trying to say is, how does anything complex arise in nature? This is the question we'll be exploring in this video, and we're going to start by playing a game, the game of life. This game was invented in the 1970s by a mathematician named John Conway. Him and his buddies at Los Alamos National Laboratory were messing around on a go board just like this one. Each square on the board is called a cell, and each cell can be either dead or alive. We'll put a marker to represent a living cell, and all the empty cells are dead cells. Each cell is surrounded by eight neighbouring cells. Now, whether or not a cell stays alive in the next turn, or as we call it in the game, the next generation, depends on how many of its neighbors are alive. The rules are, any live cell with fewer than two live neighbors dies, as if by underpopulation. Any live cell with two or three live neighbors lives onto the next generation. Any live cell with more than three live neighbors dies, as if by overpopulation. And any dead cell with exactly three live neighbors becomes a live cell, as if by reproduction. Why don't we play a game? Let's start with this configuration. So looking at this live cell, we can see that of its eight neighbors, two are alive. So according to the rules, it lives on to the next generation. Now looking at this one, two of its neighbors are also alive, so it too lives on. And the same with this one. Now this empty square has three live neighbors, so it becomes a live cell. And that is our first generation. If we follow the rules again, we can see that all of the live cells live onto the next generation, and no new cells are born. In Game of Life jargon, this pattern is called a still life, as it remains unchanged forever. Let's try a slightly more exciting configuration. This pattern oscillates back and forth, so it's called an oscillator. I think it's safe to say that neither of the patterns that we've seen are very interesting. But what were we expecting? We put in very simple rules, so it's only natural that we get out very simple behaviours. As they say, you get out what you put in, right? Well, let me show you just one more pattern. This fun little guy is called a glider for its appearance of gliding across the board. Now this behavior is somewhat exciting. We've put in the same simple rules, but we're getting out surprising and seemingly complex behavior. To some extent, it even appears lifelike as if it's moving with agency, but of course it's not. 
The discovery of the glider caused a surge of interest in the game, and programmers from all over the world went nuts in search for new and interesting patterns. I'd like to show you some of the most interesting ones. The game of life is much easier to play now than it was in the 70s because of the evolution of computers and programs. This is a website with the rules of the game of life already pre-programmed into it. This is called the Gosper Glider Gun. It generates a continuous stream of gliders, the cool little guys we just saw on the go board. Remember, we're still using the same simple rules from before, yet we seem to have created a self-organizing pattern which produces a limitless amount of complexity. This cool critter is called a back rake, ejecting gliders as it moves along the board. This type of pattern is known as a breeder for its apparent rapid population growth. Now this particular pattern caused a lot of ruckus when it was discovered. It's called Gemini because it creates an exact copy of itself while destroying its parent. This was the first instance of self-replication found in the game. There are so many more patterns that have been found displaying extremely complex, intricate and unpredictable behaviour. And they all arise from the simple rules we started with on the Go board. This goes to show that sometimes you can get out a lot more than what you put in, that the level of complexity displayed by a system isn't always proportional to the amount of complexity put in, contrary to our human intuition. There's no doubt that the game of life is really cool, but it's not unique. In fact, it's just one of a larger class of something called cellular automata. Cellular automata are a grid of cells which behave automatically, that is, with pre-programmed rules. The Game of Life is the most famous cellular automaton, but there are many more with different sets of rules. So coming back to our question, what does this have to do with nature? Sure, it shows us that very complex behaviours can arise from simple rules, but our world is not a computer simulation with rules programmed into it by someone. Well, that we know of. But although our universe is much more complicated than a cellular automata, it does follow rules the laws of physics. A snowflake is a perfect example of how complex structure can arise from simple physical laws. Every snowflake begins as a water droplet freezing onto a speck of dust or pollen. As this droplet catches more water molecules, they form themselves into a hexagon. This is due to the shape of each water molecule and to maximize attractive forces and minimize repulsive ones. From there, more water molecules land on the corners simply because they stick out further than the sides, so it's just more likely for stuff to land there. The shape of the arms are dictated by physical factors like temperature and humidity, and other properties of the atmosphere. The formation of the snowflake is dependent both on the laws of physics and the state of each molecule's neighbouring molecules. If we try to replicate these rules with a cellular automaton, we get very snowflake-like patterns. A biological example that has striking similarities to cellular automata are the patterns on certain animals. This cellular automaton, called Rule 30, became famous because of its resemblance to the pattern on the textile cone snail shell. The exact mechanisms by which the shell pattern is formed are not fully understood, but biologists suspect that each cell secretes pigments according to the activating and inhibiting activity of its neighbour pigment cells a chemical version of a mathematical rule. And this wouldn't be the first time we've seen chemical reactions form intricate and mesmerizing patterns, as demonstrated by this beluzov zabotinsky reaction. Because of examples like these, many computer scientists and theoretical biologists believe that cellular automata are the key to understanding the complex patterns and behaviors we see in nature. They've been used to study crystal formation, pattern formation in animals and plants, insect colonies, fluid turbulence, galaxy formation, and anything else that can be modeled as a large number of simple agents that interact to create complex results. It's fascinating to wonder how far these models could take us. Might we one day have a cellular automata for more advanced emergent phenomena like life or consciousness? Only time will tell. Now coming back to our more human endeavours, wouldn't it be nice if you could just leave a bunch of these parts here, put in some simple rules and come back in 10 hours and have it assembled itself? 
this would completely revolutionize IKEA's furniture model. Maybe we should draw inspiration from cellular automata and totally rethink engineering and design. Who says that the more complex a structure is, the more work needs to go into it? Well, scientists and engineers are doing just that by exploring the idea of self-assembling materials and robots. A complexity group at Stanford University are experimenting with self-assembling wires. By applying a large voltage to a bunch of ball bearings in castor oil, they've managed to get the balls to start forming chains as they try to reach the outside of the dish. Yeah, snowflakes aren't the only things that can use physics to their advantage. A research group from MIT are creating self-assembling origami robots triggered by heat. They can then be controlled remotely by a person. That's pretty cool. Then there are these self-assembling cubes being developed by the Swiss Institute of Technology, Lausanne. They can flat out be programmed to assemble into a variety of structures. Whether uncovering nature's secrets or building origami robots, cellular automata are helping us understand the complexity of complexity. Stephen Wolfram put it best when he said, this discovery is helping us understand the world of constructing things from dumb components. So beautiful. Wolfram also said something else that caught my attention, and that was, I can't help but wonder that if Rule 30 had been found in antiquity, a lot of ideas about nature and science would have evolved differently. This caught my attention for two reasons. The first being, it's a fascinating idea to think that maybe um, ideas of science and nature could have evolved differently. So the way we go about doing science now is very top down. That is, we discover some phenomenon and then try to describe the final product with an all encompassing mathematical law. And it's been working pretty well for us. But Wolfram is suggesting that perhaps if Rule 30 were found in antiquity, math and science may have developed a more bottom-up approach, looking at the behavior of the smallest pieces first and seeing how that produces the final result. The second thing that caught my attention was the use of the word evolve. We tend to think of our scientific discoveries as exactly that, discoveries, like the laws and theories of our current science couldn't be any other way. But could it be that if we discovered these laws in a different order, our whole theory of science could have turned out differently? How much of our science is discovery and how much is human intervention? This question has been plaguing my mind for some time and I really wanted to explore it in depth, so I'm making a video about it over on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming platform built for creators by creators, mainly your favorite educational creators like Adam Neely, Polymatter, Real Engineering, Wendover Productions, Lindsay Ellis, and many more. We created Nebula for the reason that oftentimes we want to experiment with different types of content that may not perform so well on YouTube. <clears throat> so in my case, I want to explore the more philosophical aspect of math and science, like this question of how much of math is discovered and how much is invented. And this is quite different to my usual content where I give you guys hard facts and well-developed theories. It's going to be largely my own explorations, which I've got to say I find quite daunting. One reason I became a science communicator and not a scientist is because I feel a lot more comfortable presenting other people's conclusions than my own. I feel like it takes real confidence and guts. So this is kind of my version of dipping my toes in the water and coming up with my own conclusions and presenting them. Basically, Nebula is a platform where creators feel like they can try out new things without suffering horrible consequences if it turns out terribly. So if this is something that you'd like to support, consider signing up with the link below. Our friends at CuriosityStream, a documentary streaming service, are actually running a promotion where you get Nebula for free when you sign up with them. So if you are considering joining, that's the deal you'll want to get as it's two streaming services for the price of one. All the links are in the description, or you can go to curiositystream.com slash up and atom. That's it from me, and I will see you in the next episode. Bye.